Okay, hey Sophie, how are you Hi, doing? Tim. <laughs> I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I thought you might like to sit down for some cat cats and chats. I do want to sit down for cats and chats. Now this series has a name. This is uh, great. I know. Before <laughs> you had to discuss what yeah. would be. The Okay, so what are you excited about in maths at the moment? I am excited about using math to understand how the world works. And my favorite question about how the world works right now is how do continuous dynamical systems compute? Would you like to, okay, so I know what those words mean individually. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you mean by that? So to me, the mystery is like, when I took intro to computer science, they were like, your computer is full of zeros and ones. And like, if you look inside your computer, there aren't like actual zeros and ones floating around, right? It's like electrons flowing, you know, electrons flowing through wires, which is like an analogy with like, you know, fluid dynamics and stuff like that. And so like at a very low level, it's this continuous system. It's just like things flowing through pipes, but somehow out of that, like, the zeros and ones are really an excellent abstraction and they totally work. And the question is like, how do you make that leap? Why does it always work? Like what, what things would you need to construct this? Okay. And I think this sort of thing is going on all over the place. So, yeah. Okay. So it's like a, like introducing a discretization of a system or something that gives you like a useful computational. Yeah. And not that it's just like, I think there's a way of being an easy answer where you're just like, oh, I just decide that, you know, if the voltage is over this, that's a one, if the voltage is under this, that's a zero. But like, just making those arbitrary cutoffs everywhere seems like it wouldn't in general be very robust. Yeah. And somehow there's something really natural going on that makes it robust and makes it like actually usable and sort of appearing in nature, not just in our like engineered systems. Yeah, that's super cool. I remember being fascinated when I first, I don't know, learned about computers or whatever, watching YouTube videos, of people building computers out of like mechanical, like marbles dropping down. Exactly. Like that yeah. to me, super cool. I don't know anything about it, but it's super cool. So how are you like, um, how are you approaching this question? Like what, what kind of stuff are you looking into? Yeah, so I guess I wanna say one other thing also, which is that the main example I actually think about a lot is our brains, which are also continuous systems. They're just like ion channels opening, letting in some ions, they flow in, stuff happens. Um, but then like, you know, when I think about how I think it feels very discreet, I'm like, ah, cat, dog, yes, no, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and so I work with some like computational neuroscientists is part of sort of the inspiration for a lot of this work for the math. So the picture is like the way I think about a continuous system is you have like your state space, which is like a, a flat plane like this. Mm -hmm. And then over it, you have some sort of hilly landscape. And that defines your dynamics. And then when you drop a marble, it'll roll, you know, according to that landscape and land somewhere. And so uh, the places where it lands are called attractors. And those are like really the places things relax to. Yeah. Like local, these are like local minimum, right? Yeah. This kind of thing. Okay. Um, and so the question is, so, so that's like part one. And then part two is like, you know, in applied category theory, we often talk about, you know, systems aren't closed. They like interact with each other. They have parameters, they have inputs, they send information to other systems. So like now imagine the system, but I have a knob and as I turn the knob, the landscape changes. And so you can imagine like, suppose I just had like one valley and I turn my knob and like the valley moves over. Mm -hmm. Like the ball is sort of just gonna like stay in the valley. Sure, okay, yeah. So it's like, even though, you know, sort of something in the continuous dynamics has changed, nothing discrete has happened to me, you know, like sort of wow. the same. If it was a zero before, it should still sort of be a zero. If I was thinking okay. about a cat before, I'm still thinking about a cat. That makes sense. But then you could sort of imagine another system, like imagine I had two valleys, mm -hmm. and when I turn my knob, this one's sort of going to go up, and like, uh, okay, all will roll into this one. And then you're like, oh, something has happened, something has changed. Okay. Um, and so this is sort of the uh, sort of making this story formal about how uh, changing the parameter of a continuous system can give you these sort of discrete changes. Okay. And how how seriously should I take that analogy? Like, because the thing that I imagine in my head now is, say, you've got the little ball in the well. If you turn mm -hmm. the, and the well moves left and right, if you turn the dial, then yeah, the ball stays at the bottom of the well. But if I turn that dial really quickly, 
like I could shoot the ball out of the world? Or do you kind of not care so much about the realities of how quickly you would turn your knob or whatever, you know? I totally care. I think that's actually oh, like okay. amazing. Cause uh, for a long time, I was thinking a lot about time scales and like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, things like this and one of sort of the the theorems in my work says something like if you change the parameter slowly enough then good things happen sort of uh, okay okay I, I think another way of saying the thing you were talking about is like you could imagine in a, my two valley situation mm -hmm. where like if if I like turn my knob and it raises and then comes right back down the ball will still stay here. It won't okay. have done the flip that I wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. So you have to like change that landscape slowly so that the ball has time to relax. Okay, this is super cool. So is this what you're working on for your thesis work or is this separate? Yeah, this is like a lot of my thesis work. And then I've also, I have some like, I I do talk to people at Topos about it and mm -hmm. hoping to like move it into the, the Topos -y direction. Okay. What, yeah, what kind of language like um like is it about do you use like polyfunctors stuff or is it more dynamical systems kind of language what what is it now and what do you kind of hope for it to be yeah so right now um the category theory mostly is like a way of organizing all these ideas mm -hmm. um i think more interesting is like you know my dream is to have this map from if you have a continuous system to its discrete computation it performs to be mm -hmm. functorial. So that if I compose two continuous systems, and here I'm thinking with like, uh, you know, David's Vivac style wiring diagrams of systems, then you'll get compositions of discrete systems. Or sorry, okay. if I compose two continuous yeah. systems, what do they compute? That should be the same as looking at their computations and composing those. Yeah. Okay. It actually turns out this is kind of hard in some ways. Yeah, that seems really hard because if they have like different discretization thresholds or something exactly fine they could be super which discretization threshold do you take kind of thing yeah exactly. okay so i call this the spec sheet like what what type of interactions they are expecting okay like i ex you know these ranges are good for me please move slowly like this or okay. something like okay. that so it's sort of like a continuous system plus a spec sheet gives you a discrete computation mm, okay i see what you mean okay and then maybe is the composition something I don't know anything about this stuff, but I'm going to try to say the words anyway. Like, is this, I've seen this notion of people talking about weighted categories or kind of like approximate compositioning categories where like you compose things, but the things have numbers attached to them maybe, or like they're mm -hmm. over some post set. And when you compose stuff, you know, you get like a bound on the weight of the composition and stuff like this, like some way of doing more than just morphisms. Like your morphisms have labels on them kind of thing is this the right kind of framework it's not, I've, I've been trying i've been thinking more about how do they compose on the nose but uh, i feel I, I actually have like a lot of other places in my work where i'm also like man these things shouldn't compose but there okay. should be like they should compose pretty well or like i want to be able to track how well they compose okay let's talk about something else that i know you do then yeah. <laughs> which is you do some algebraic julia stuff and some more scientific modeling things as well i do would you like to say some things about those absolutely so i guess like you can imagine you're trying to come up with an epidemiology model mm -hmm. and if you read epidemiology papers you know there's all these parts there's like people are moving around you know, people are going through like various infection processes. There, you know, there are mosquitoes that are also moving around and going through their infection processes and they breed and they have new mosquitoes. And so there's like all these like subsystems going on in this model. And, you know, what is one thing category theory is great at is composition. Um, and so a lot of this sort of scientific modeling work is thinking about how do we um, compose scientific models? Um, and then there's sort of a lot of mathematical benefits to that. But another thing that uh, you sort of mentioned algebraic Julia is being able to actually implement that in software so that the software is really matching the math. You can sort of be like, here's how I want to compose my submodels. Here's what the submodels are, compose. And it like gives you the full model. Okay. Like that. And this is, is this the, what you talked about at the ACT conference this year? Yeah, this year at the ACT conference, I talked about um, sort of composing PetriNet models. And mm -hmm. actually that was a, a, the type of composition where we're doing model stratification. So taking like uh, two types of models and being like, okay, so you have these people moving around, 
you also have these people getting infected. How do we sort of stratify the infection process by sort of this model of people moving around or something like that. So with that stuff, do you have any ideas of where it's going to move in the future? Or do you feel like that's a project that's kind of as complete as a mathematical project ever is, you know? No, I think there's a lot of, um, there's just like a lot of directions to go, especially with working. So like um, I worked with uh, Sean Wu, who uh, works on these malaria models and sort mm -hmm. of talking with him about you know, what do you actually need to like, here's, here is a very concrete, very large model that he works with, like, how can we make the math help you out? Um, and sort of the same story with um, Nate Osgood and Xiaoyan Li at uh, University of Saskatchewan. And they're sort of doing these stock and flow diagrams. So another paper that I was part of at ACT was this like composition of stock and flow diagrams. And somewhere where that's going is like they do all these analyses of stock and flow diagrams and sort of what would it mean to do those analyses compositionally or like how can we fit that into this work? It's very satisfying when you do something and a real life thing comes out of it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, thanks. That was super cool to hear. Um, and I think I've heard rumors that there are some blog posts coming up from you. Uh, what are these going to be about? So one of them is sort of about that scientific modeling work. So using algebraic dynamics, which is the implementation of this sort of composition of dynamical systems used for scientific modeling, um, but it composes uh, like physical mechanical spring systems. And it has these cool animations okay. of like, if you take two springs and compose them so they're in parallel, then you get a little, little spring. I've seen the animations, they're very cool. I am looking forward to that blog post. And what's the other one about? Um, the other one is one I've been working on with David about heavy and learning. So um, sort of a dynamic um, monoidal category for these heavy and learners, um, okay. which I think he talked about with you, actually. You mentioned, yeah, this whole thing of like dynamic is things enriched in org, right? This structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's super cool. Well, I look forward to those blog posts and uh, we will see you around. Sweet. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Bye. Do it both ways, like on the Great British Bake Off. Oh, yes, exactly. Oh, my God. Yeah, we should do the Great British Bake Off, but somehow make it about category theory. Yeah. I don't know how, but I'm into that.